Hey, Lunarnet, it's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, so whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings segments. Today's topic is the elven hero Glorfindel. So Glorfindel, I think, is actually a good candidate to be a major player in the Amazon series. Why? Because we know of his activities in the First Age, and we know of his activities in the Third Age, but there's really almost nothing written about him in the Second Age, which is the time frame that the Amazon series takes place. So you've got this really uh, powerful elven character, and nothing's been written about him. So you can put him, in some ways, wherever you want to. Uh, last week, I did a video about uh, casting theories for the Amazon series, in, uh, specifically regarding a leaked audition script that I thought perhaps might be uh, a character representing Glorfindel's mother. The character's name at the moment is Eldian. Uh, I think that is a placeholder name. In any case, if you want to see that, just uh, go back and check that out. I won't belabor the point, but just to say that um, Glorfindel's parentage is unknown. Tolkien never spelled out who his parents are. But, but there are a few hints. One, he's got golden hair, which is a rarity for elves. Most have dark or silver hair. Also, he uh, feels kinship with Turgon, who is the king of Gondolin. He's a Noldor elf, and so we feel like he probably has some kind of kinship to the Noldor tribe of elves. I've also done a video on the uh, elven tribes, if you want to catch up on that. But, okay, so... With that in mind, I have a, a quick theory on the parentage. Again, I mentioned this in the last video, but just to sum it up, the gold hair is something that is, uh, it's so rare uh, that it's mostly found in the tribe of elves called the Vanyar. And the Vanyar don't feature very much in Tolkien's works. But there are a couple of exceptions. One of those exceptions is the Vanyar elf Indus. And Indus married... Finve, who was the king of the Noldor elves, uh, and they had four kids. From that line, we get Galadriel with her golden hair. Uh, it's a feature that runs through that family. Galadriel's father was Finarfin, who was one of the sons of Indus and Finve. Well, Finve and Indus also had two daughters. One of those daughters, Irame, actually did come over to Middle Earth. Uh, with the exiled Noldor elves, um, as we know Glorfindel did as well. So a reasonable theory would be that Irame, who has the gene for the golden hair, is Glorfindel's mother. Therefore, Glorfindel would be like a cousin to Galadriel, and also a cousin to Turgon, hence the reason that he ends up in Gondolin. Okay, so uh, that said, uh, Tolkien never spelled out uh, Glorfindel's parentage. Um, I'm going to read you a quick uh, couple of lines here. This is actually from Lord of the Rings, so this is in the Third Age, and this is a description, almost one of the first times we see Glorfindel in uh, the Lord of the Rings. This is a description that Tolkien writes. Glorfindel was tall and straight. His hair was of shining gold, his face fair and young and fearless and full of joy. His eyes were bright and keen and his voice like music. On his brow sat wisdom, and in his hand was strength." So, interestingly, um, we've got this tale from the Silmarillion. Glorfindel uh, is involved in the fall of Gondolin, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then you've got this, uh, there's a Glorfindel at the Council of Elrond in uh, the Fellowship of the Ring. But uh, for a while, it was unclear as to whether that was the same Glorfindel. Is it, are these just two different elves who happen to be named Glorfindel? Um, but Tolkien eventually answered that question as, nope, it's the same guy. Um, and so I'll, I'll run through how this all works out. But essentially, yeah, you've got this character that has uh, gone to the First Age uh, and is all the way into the Third Age with the War of the Ring. So... Let's uh, let's do a little history here for Glorfindel. So we'll take it back into the First Age. Um, in the First Age, you've got the situation where Feanor, 
who's the uh, infamous elf and leader of the Noldor. Uh, he basically decides he's going to go to Middle-earth and uh, seek out Morgoth, who's got the Silmaril gems that he made and were stolen from him. The Valar exiled the Noldor at that time, uh, and so anyone who goes over to Middle-earth at this point is, is exiled from Valinor by the Valar. Well, one of those elves is Glorfindel. Uh, he goes mainly because of his kinship to King Turgon, uh, and is like, I don't know if I need to go, but I'm going because I have an allegiance to this group. Um, very notably, he does not take place in, in an activity called uh, the First Kin Slaying. It's where elves killed elves. The Noldor elves killed some other elves uh, trying to get their boats. And that particular act was so heinous uh, that it was part of why the Valar exiled the Noldor elves. So just so you know, uh, Glorfindel did not take part in that horrible act. So, uh, flash forward. Now they're in Middle-earth. Um, they are in Gondolin. And Turgon, who is now who's king of Gondolin, uh, his sister, Arathel, um, wants to leave the city. The city is a secret city, so it's like leaving is kind of a big deal. Because you're like, oh, you might give the secret away. But she wants to go and see, uh, see the forests, see nature again. Um, she's she's basically wants to get out of the city. So it's arranged that she's going to go visit her brother, Fingon, and she's given an escort. There's a few um, high-level elves, including Glorfindel, and they are escorting her to visit her brother. Well, on the journey, she changes her mind. She decides she wants to meet up with the Sons of Feanor. The Sons of Feanor are not particularly well received, depending on which tribe of elf you're talking about. But she wants to go visit the Sons of Feanor. And so this change of plan changes the journey. And through a series of misadventures, they end up straying a little too close to a little thing called Nandungortheb. The Valley of Dreadful Death. Now, you know, if you're going off on a holiday and you're thinking of places to visit, maybe the Valley of Dreadful Death might be a place you avoid. Well, uh, they don't. Uh, and so that happens to be where the giant spider Ungoliant lives and her spawn at this point. Uh, and so basically they get so close to this valley that they get kind of caught up in the mesh, the webbing of darkness, and they get separated. So Arathel is separated from her escort, and then Glorfindel and company are attacked by the spawn of Ungoliant, these giant spiders. They're forced to like basically run for their lives. They barely escape with their lives, but Arathel has now disappeared. They search for her, they can't find her, so they have to go back to Gondolin to report to King Turgon that his sister is missing. Uh, as it turns out, she did not perish in that moment. Um, there's more to that story to tell. If you want to know more on that, uh, I did a video on Aeol the Dark Elf. Uh, and feel free to, you can catch up on the rest of that story. It's, really, it's a really cool fairy tale. Tragic, but uh, a fairy tale nonetheless. In any case, we see Glorfindel show up in this particular part of Tolkien's myth. The next time we see him, is in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, where the elves are attacking Morgoth and suffer horrible, horrible losses. And as a result, they are forced to retreat what's left of them. And it's Glorfindel that protects the flank of the elves uh, as they are retreating. So he's, he's battle-tested at this point. So during this time, he is a, a resident, a lord, in Gondolin. And he is the lord of one of the Twelve Houses. I should probably do a video on the Twelve Houses of Gondolin at some point, but one of those houses is the House of the Yellow Flower. Their symbol is a sun with the, with the rays of the sun coming out. Um, and so this particular house is run by Glorfindel. And at the time of the fall of Gondolin, Morgoth it discovers the whereabouts of Gondolin, sends a giant force to attack it. Gondolin falls. In that battle, uh, the house of the Yellow Flower 
uh, are trying to defend the great market. They're trying to give people time to escape the city, for one thing. But they defend the great market. Uh, they are against Balrogs. They're against orcs. Uh, and then there are fire drakes that show up and just take out most of the house of the Yellow Flower. I believe that particular house took maybe some of the highest casualties of any of the houses. Glorfindel manages to survive and is helping the royal house escape. King Turgon has died in this battle, but his son, uh, Prince Tuor, and his wife Idril, and their son, Yarendil, are still alive, and they're trying to flee the city. Yarendil ends up becoming incredibly important to Tolkien's mythology, uh, among other things, is also uh, the father of Elrond. But, um, so they're fleeing the city. The city's going down, and Glorfindel is helping them escape. On the way, they encounter uh, this mountain pass, and Morgoth has set up spies to monitor these passes. Uh, I'm going to read you an excerpt here where uh, we see Glorfindel have to fight a Balrog. Along that narrow way their march was strung when they were ambushed by orcs. For Morgoth had set watchers all about the encircling hills, and a Balrog was with them. Many are the songs that have been sung of the duel of Glorfindel with the Balrog upon a pinnacle of rock in that high place, and both fell to ruin in the abyss. Then Thorondor bore up Glorfindel's body out of the abyss, and they buried him in a mound of stones beside the pass. And a green turf came there, and yellow flowers bloomed upon it amid the barrenness of stone, until the world was changed. So, we have this moment when Glorfindel confronts a Balrog on a mountain pass, trying to defend this little seven-year-old kid, Yarendil, and his parents, and they both fall from the pass, uh, and his, his body is destroyed. Uh, now, uh, Thorondor is uh, Lord of the Eagles, comes in, uh, rescues Glorfindel's body from the pass, and he is buried. Um, interestingly, it says yellow flowers bloomed on it. Well, of course, what is he? He's the Lord of the House of Yellow Flowers. So, uh, it, you know, uh, hey, little metaphor there. Um, but, uh, but yes, so he essentially, much like Gandalf, falls in his battle with the Balrog. Uh, much like Gandalf falls in his battle with the Balrog, we have a similar thing where Glorfindel falls in his battle. So thereafter, uh, the survivors, the refugees from Gondolin, they sing songs in remembrance of the sacrifice of Glorfindel to aid in their escape. Now notably, this giant heroic act uh, is noted by the Valar. So when elves perish, their bodies perish, they go to the halls of Mandos. And if you're one of these exiled elves, like Glorfindel fit into that category, um, you're going to kind of stay there in purgatory for a while. Um, however, because Glorfindel had not participated in that first kin slaying, the, the sinful act that the Valar really just couldn't uh, forgive, and the fact that he had given his body in sacrifice uh, to his fellow kinsmen, he is given the gift of being able to come back. Uh, and so he is essentially reborn. And for much of the Second Age, you know, for, I don't know, a thousand years plus of the Second Age, he lives in Valinor with the Valar. And essentially he's got, he's, he's actually given extra power, like he's almost on par with one of those Maiar spirits. He's that powerful. Um, and so, yeah, so that's his existence for a long time. He's in Valinor. Um, and it's in the Second Age, 1600, when Sauron forges the Ring of Power and announces himself as, By the way, you thought I was Anatar. Ah, it's Sauron. I'm back, and I've got a ring. Um, it's at that time that the Valar send Glorfindel back to Middle-earth. Essentially, I assume, to deal with Sauron, to help deal with Sauron, much like they do with uh, uh, Gandalf and the other wizards at, 
at a later date. So Glorfindel is sent back to Middle Earth. He's back in the action. Tolkien, um, he had a few uh, thoughts on what year actually Glorfindel was sent back to Middle Earth, but he essentially settled on the 1600 and the Second Age date. So again, this is this is thousands of years before the actual War of the Ring. Again, we're in the Second Age, War of the Rings in the Third Age, but uh, this is again prime time for the Amazon series. This is exactly when the Amazon series is going to be taking place. Hence, I feel like Glorfindel is going to be a major player in the events that follow. And perhaps, based on that audition script, perhaps his mother will also be a player in all this. So as I say, um, much of the Second Age is unwritten for Glorfindel. But we know that he survives well into the Third Age, into the Fourth Age, in fact. So uh, he survives this time, and, and he's obviously going to be uh, in the fight. So uh, however that plays out, the next time we see Glorfindel is about a thousand years, a little over a thousand years before the War of the Ring. This is in the Third Age. It is 1975, I believe. And this is involving the Witch King. So the Witch King has taken over the city of Fornost. And Glorfindel arrives with an army from Rivendell um, at the same time that Yarnur, who's the, currently the prince of Gondor, arrives with a big army from Gondor. And so together it's elves and men attacking the Witch King. They crush the Witch King in this battle. But notably, there's a moment when the Witch King challenges Yarnir, again he's still prince, eventually he's going to be king of Gondor, but at this moment he's still prince, challenges Prince Yarnir to a one-on-one -on -one, uh, duel on the battlefield. And Tolkien writes that Yarnir's horse uh, freaks out, bolts, and runs off with Yarnir um, off, the, off the field, essentially. Um, so the Witch King is laughing at the fact that uh, you know this leader of, of the Gondor's troops has fled from him. But he quickly shuts up when Glorfindel arrives. So Glorfindel shows up to uh, basically defend uh, Yarnir and, uh, and take on the Witch King. Witch King immediately flees. It shows you how powerful Glorfindel is, right? When, I mean, the Witch King has just said, like, fight me, Prince of Gondor! Ah! Oh, you? Uh, never mind. Uh, and he takes off. So Witch King flees, uh, leaving his army behind. His army is destroyed. He does survive because he escaped. But he does not take on Glorfindel in single combat in that moment. Yarnir gets his horse uh, you know, reined in, comes back, wants to give chase. And this is where Glorfindel gives a very famous prophecy. And that prophecy is, Do not pursue him, the Witch King. He will not return to this land. Far off yet is his doom, and not by the hand of man will he fall. Okay, so obviously far off yet was his doom, because he was going to live another thousand years plus. He's going to be killed off in the War of the Ring, and he wasn't going to be killed off by a man. He was going to be killed off by a woman, Eowyn. That prophecy ended up giving the Witch King maybe a little too much uh, self-confidence. That, hey, I'm immortal. Well, he wasn't immortal. He just didn't uh, think about what the prophecy might mean. But, yes, that's Glorfindel really impacting, uh, you know, the, the mythology in that moment. Um, just to follow up on that. So, Yarnur becomes King of Gondor. When he becomes king, the Witch King sends out another challenge to him. Like, hey, remember how you ran away from me in the Battle of Fornost? Well, you know, I'm still here. Let's do this. Yarnir wants to go and and basically avenge his honor, I guess. You know, he feels like he was shamed in that moment back at the Battle of Fornost. Uh, he is convinced by his advisors not to go. Seven years later, Witch King makes another uh, challenge and this time, Yarnir takes off his crown, lays it down, heads off, goes through the gates of Minas Morgul, and is never seen again. So we can assume 
that he accepted a challenge and the Witch King uh, probably cheated or maybe didn't have to cheat. Whichever, whatever happened, Yarnir was killed off, almost certainly. Uh, and so uh, that's how that, that particular unfortunate set of circumstances ended. If he'd have listened to Glorfindel, he'd have still been alive, but he didn't. So now we flash forward to the events of The Lord of the Rings. And we see Glorfindel in the, uh, almost exclusively in the, the Fellowship of the Ring. And obviously he's not in the movies. So Peter Jackson made a call not to put him in, I think because he wasn't in all of the books. His, his part pretty much ends with the Council of Elrond. Uh, and he decided instead to use that moment to accentuate Arwen's character. And so at the expense, unfortunately, of Glorfindel, um, he, he made that choice. I get it. It makes sense. Um, he intended to have that relationship between Arwen and Aragorn go throughout all three movies, whereas Glorfindel's part where he would have ended right there at the Council of Elrond. So, that said, in the books, uh, we see some really cool stuff that Glorfindel does. First of all, Glorfindel is sent by Elrond from Rivendell to find Frodo. Um, and uh, basically help him, guide him to back to Rivendell. Give him support. And on the way to find Frodo, he actually confronts three Black Riders on a bridge. And again, just like the Witch King, the Black Riders flee. So imagine that scenario where they've got a lone elf on a bridge, there's three Black Riders, and they're like, oh no, not that guy. And they take off, and Glorfindel actually chases them. So it's like they're, they're on the run. Glorfindel's trying to chase them down. Um, later on, there's even, there's like, I think it says there's two more uh, Black Riders that he finds that he ends up chasing as well. So they're, they're kind of terrified of Glorfindel. And uh, so it really shows you the, the magnitude of his power and his reputation. Uh, anyway, so he eventually finds Frodo. And he, you know, Frodo's been injured at this point, been stabbed by the dagger on Weathertop. And now it's really critical to get into Rivendell to uh, have him be healed by Elrond. So here's a situation where he's giving his horse to Frodo. You shall ride my horse, said Glorfindel. But you need not fear. My horse will not let any rider fall that I command him to bear. And if danger presses too near, he will bear you away with a speed that even the black steeds of the enemy cannot rival. No, he will not, said Frodo. I shall not ride him. If I am to be carried off to Rivendell or anywhere else, leaving my friends behind in danger? Glorfindel smiled. I doubt very much, he said, if your friends would be in danger if you were not with them. The pursuit would follow you and leave us in peace, I think. It is you, Frodo, and that which you bear that brings us all in peril. So interesting, he says that which you bear. So he knows about the ring in that moment. Um, so he's not only been sent just, oh, find that hobbit that's important to Gandalf and bring him here. He's like, no, the guy who's bearing the ring. Um, so it's kind of interesting that he's been entrusted with that information. Again, showing how important he is uh, in this story. So uh, they make their way toward Rivendell, and at some point, Glorfindel hears the Black Riders coming. One moment, Glorfindel turned and listened. Then he sprang forward with a loud cry. Fly, he called, fly! The enemy is upon us! The white horse leaped forward. The hobbits ran down the slope. Glorfindel and Strider followed his rear guard. They were only halfway across the flat when suddenly there was a noise of horses galloping. Out of the gate in the trees that they had just left, rode a black rider. He reined his horse in and halted, swaying in his saddle. Another followed him, and then another. Then again, two more. Ride forward, ride, cried Glorfindel to Frodo. So sure enough, Frodo rides on, gets to the ford, turns around, kind of gives a challenge to the riders. Uh, there's a conversation they have, and the riders begin to walk into the, uh, to, across the river, the river obviously crashes into them. Now, here's the cool part, though. Some of the riders were already in the river, and they get hit. But there are several other riders that 
kind of see what's coming and don't don't commit to going into the river right away. And so what we see here is Frodo as he's fading, you know, the dagger is working its way to his heart. He's fading off and we're we're getting this from his point of view as what he sees and it's it's pretty interesting. With his last failing senses, Frodo heard cries and it seemed to him that he saw, beyond the riders that hesitated on the shore, a shining figure of white light, and behind it ran small shadowy forms, waving flames that flared red in the gray mist that was falling over the world. The black horses were filled with madness, and leaping forward in terror, they bore their riders into the rushing flood. Their piercing cries were drowned in the roaring of the river as it carried them away. Okay, then as Frodo wakes up, he's talking to Gandalf, and he asks him what he had just seen. I thought that I saw a white figure that shone and did not grow dim like the others. Was that Glorfindel then? Yes, you saw him for a moment as he is upon the other side, one of the mighty of the firstborn. He is an elf lord of a house of princes. Indeed, there is a power in Rivendell to withstand the might of Mordor for a while. Okay, so <laughs> really cool here. Um, basically, as Frodo is fading, he sees the aura that is projected by Glorfindel as he would be seen in Valinor, essentially. And it's that, that aura that uh, basically makes... Uh, the Nazgul and their, their steeds right, right, run in fear and basically run into the flood to get away from Glorfindel. I mean, that's how, again, this guy, this guy, he's off the charts in terms of powers. So now we come to the Council of Elrond. And this is kind of the last we really see of Glorfindel in the story. But again, he has a big part to play in this council in the books. It's been suggested in the council that perhaps they give the ring to Tom Bombadil. After all, Tom Bombadil is not affected by the ring, and, you know, yeah, he's got his own little woods. Maybe maybe just give it off to Tom and let him do some caretaking. But it's Glorfindel who advises against that, and here's what he says. But in any case, said Glorfindel, to send the ring to him, Tom, would only postpone the day of evil. Soon or late, the Lord of the Rings would learn of its hiding place and would bend all his power towards it. Could that power be defied by Bombadil alone? I think not. I think that in the end, if all else is conquered, Bombadil will fall, last as he was first, and then night will come. So basically saying, yeah, that's not really much of an option. You know, Tom Bombadil might hold out for a while, but eventually the power of Sauron will overcome him. So then there are strategizing. What do we do with this thing? And Glorfindel, again, he, he comes up with what he thinks are the options. Then if the ring cannot be kept from him forever by strength, said Glorfindel, two things only remain for us to attempt, to send it over the sea or to destroy it. But Gandalf has revealed to us that we cannot destroy it by any craft that we here possess, said Elrond. And they who dwell beyond the sea, in Valinor, would not receive it. For good or ill, it belongs to Middle-earth. It is for us who still dwell here to deal with it. Then, said Glorfindel, let us cast it into the depths. In the sea, it would be safe. Not safe forever, said Gandalf. There are many things in the deep waters, and seas and lands may change. And it is not our part here to take thought only for a season, or for a few lives of men, or for a passing age of the world, we should seek a final end of this menace, even if we do not hope to make one. It's like, wow. So yeah, so Glorfindel is suggesting, all right, if, if we can't just send it over to Valinor and let them hold it, uh, let's just throw it into the sea, you know? And Gandalf's point is, sure, it'll be safe for a while, uh, years go by, perhaps, but we're trying to find a final end to this, not just a temporary fix. Which, I don't know, considering their desperation, uh, I think I might have argued harder on the temporary fix 
I'm like, okay, what? The chances of us throwing this into the sea, not that it's not that difficult to do. Chances of us taking this and throwing it into a volcano in the middle of enemy territory seems a lot harder. But in any case, as we know, it works out for the best. <laughs> but that was Glorfindel's uh, advice, was perhaps to throw it into the sea. All right, so now the conversation at the council uh, turns to the three elven rings and whether they can be used in some way in a defensive measure against Sauron. And it's really interesting here, um, Elrond gives the state of affairs with the three elven rings. And it's interesting because they actually don't know what will happen when the one ring is destroyed. So uh, here we go. Um, we know not for certain, answered Elrond sadly. Some hope that the three rings, which Sauron has never touched, would then become free and their rulers might heal the hurts of the world that he has wrought. But maybe when the one has gone, the three will fail and many fair things will fade and be forgotten. That is my belief. Yet all the elves are willing to endure this chance, said Glorfindel. If by it the power of Sauron may be broken and the fear of his dominion be taken away forever. So it's interesting. So Elrond correctly deduces that once the One Ring is destroyed, the power of the Three Rings will fade. But it's not a certainty, as he says. Like some people think, hey, the Three Rings will become really powerful after the One Ring is destroyed. But then it's Glorfindel who says, you know, we're willing to take this chance. We're willing to endure whatever comes if we can take on Sauron and defeat that fear forever. Um, showing Glorfindel's heroism and courage in, in the face of very long odds. So in the early drafts of the Lord of the Rings, Glorfindel was actually a member of the Fellowship. Eventually he gets replaced by Legolas in the drafts. Um, but there's still a moment here where Elrond is proposing that Glorfindel join the Fellowship. But it's Gandalf who rules out that notion in favor of Merry and Pippin. And his reasoning is thus. I think, Elrond, that in this matter it would be well to trust rather to their friendship than to great wisdom. Even if you chose for us an elf lord such as Glorfindel, he could not storm the Dark Tower nor open the road to the fire by the power that is in him. So basically Gandalf is saying, yeah, Glorfindel is a mighty hero, uh, but it's really not through strength of arms and that kind of heroism that we're going to win this day. If, we, if we're going to win by fighting, it's just not going to happen. So let's instead uh, look to provide the ring bearer with trusted friends as opposed to uh, mighty warriors. So Glorfindel doesn't get to go with the Fellowship. I think I would have liked to have had Glorfindel in that Fellowship, frankly, um, <laughs> considering uh, you know the Witch King ran from him and the Nazgul ran from him. And, um, but uh, but yes, yeah, so that is generally speaking uh, the story of Glorfindel. And I think I'll just finish by saying that after looking at the history of Glorfindel that I think the best way to, to describe him is as a protector. Think of all the times that he appears in Tolkien's works. Uh, we see him first show up um, protecting Arathel, Turgon's sister. Sure, she gets lost in the Valley of Dreadful Death, <laughs> but she doesn't die there. Um, that is not the end of her story. Um, uh, and so he is. that is his role, is to try to protect Arathel. Later, uh, the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, he's protecting the retreating elves, uh, protecting their flank. The fall of Gondolin, he's protecting the people of Gondolin, allowing them time to escape as he fights off the terrible army of Morgoth. Then when he finally makes the choice, to, all right, I'm going to escape with uh, the royal family, he sacrifices himself against a Balrog to save uh, this this family. He is protecting Yarnir in the Battle of Fornost. When Witch King makes a challenge, Yarnir starts to run away. It's Glorfindel who comes in and scares the Witch King off, protecting the Prince of Gondor. 
And of course, in Lord of the Rings, he's the one who is protecting Frodo from the Nazgul uh, and allowing Frodo to uh, reach Rivendell safely. Um, so yeah, I think Glorfindel the Protector would be a good way to uh, sum him up. Um, so there you go, everybody. Glorfindel. Um, if you've got a topic you'd like me to discuss, uh, put it in the comments. I'd be happy to do a video about a topic of your choosing. Thanks so much, everybody, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye!